Good morning, everyone. The class or the topic that we will be covering today is familiar ground for all of you, I believe. And we are going to be dealing with kingdoms of Bible prophecy. <coughs> Actually, this is information that has already been presented, but uh, Brother Jeff asked me to go over this in the class so that this can be put also in the record. And we will basically be covering from the Bible, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, and um, feel, please feel free to participate in this, in this presentation. And uh, I'm going to start by reading, as we will be talking about these kingdoms, this is a quote from Prophets and Kings, and it's found in page 502, 502. And it says, in the history of nations, the student of God's word may behold the literal fulfillment of divine prophecy. Babylon, shattered and broken at last, passed away because its prosperity, in prosperity, its rulers had regarded themselves as independent of God, and had ascribed the glory of their kingdom to human achievement. The Middle Persian realm was visited by the wrath of heaven, because in God's law, in it, God's law had been trampled underfoot. The fear of the Lord had found no place in the hearts of the vast majority of the people. Wickedness, blasphemy, and corruption prevailed. The kingdoms that followed were even more base and corrupt, and these sank lower and still lower in the scale of moral worth. The power exercised by every ruler on the earth is heaven imparted, and upon his use of the power thus bestowed, his success, success depends. To each the word of the divine watcher is, I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. Isaiah 45, 5. And to each the word spoken to Nebuchadnezzar of old are the lesson of life. Break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquities by sowing by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be the lengthening of thy tranquility. To understand these things, to understand that righteousness exalted a nation, that the throne is established by righteousness and upholded by mercy, to recognize the outworking of these principles in the manifestation of his power, who removeth kings and setteth up, king, up kings, this is to understand the philosophy of history. In the Word of God only, it is clearly set forth. Here it is shown that the strength of nations as of individuals is not found in the opportunities or facilities that appear to make them invincible. It is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured by the fidelity that, with which they fulfill God's purpose. So this is just a com this is an inspired commentary that we want to keep in mind as we are going to be dealing with these kingdoms is that there is a decline in the moral worth and to each of these kingdoms God granted opportunity to, uh, to man understand righteous, that under righteousness exalted a nation and that as long as they um, would honor God they could prolong their, uh, their opportunity in, in this, in reigning. But the first kingdom that it is introduced in this sequence, it was actually the kingdom that God established when he introduced his people in the land of Canaan. And this is what we found in the book of education, the page 179, education 179, it says, the final overthrow of all earthly dominions is plainly foretold in the words of truth. 
In the prophecy order, when sentence from God was pronounced upon the last king of Israel, is giving the message. Thus said the Lord, who was the last king of Israel? The, in this case, Judah. It was King Zedekiah. Thus said the Lord God, remove the diadem, take off the crown. Exalt him that is low, and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Ezekiel 21, verses 26 and 27. The crown removed from Israel passed successively to the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. God says, it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So, in this quote, it is telling us that the first kingdom that God gave opportunity in this sequence, it was the kingdom of Israel. It was a two-horn power because it was made up of two, two nations, so two kingdoms. The kingdom of the north, kingdom of the south. And more specifically, in this passage, it is talking about the kingdom of Judah, which was made up also of two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And it's telling us that because of the disobedience to the, to the covenant, they were going to be subject to the dominion, domination of heathen nations. And this is the subject of the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8. This is the subject also of the 25, 27 times, the scattering of God's people. God is going to allow these hidden nations, this is pagan nations, to come and um, oppress the people of God, to scatter them. And um, God's people are going to be subject to these civil powers, earthly civil powers, that are going to persecute and oppress them often. Um, so we are, we are familiar with the first four kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Sister White mentioned them. We have the account now in Revelation 17 that we are also familiar with. We're going to go there because the Bible is going to amplify on these kingdoms. How many kingdoms do we see clearly uh, portrayed in Daniel, in the book of Daniel? Four. It's four, yes. But in Revelation 17, it's like a repeat and enlarge. And we're going to see more than four. We're going to see there is actually <coughs> seven and even eight. And this is found <coughs> excuse me, in Revelation 17. We're going to read um, from verses 1. But we're going to read the entire chapter, actually. So, can we start with uh, Michael? Uh, could you read verses 1 and 2? And then Patrick, two, 3 and 4. And we'll get to you. <coughs> when they came... One of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee, un I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Mm -hmm. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her for fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken 
with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. We're going to stop there for a moment. <clears throat> so what we have here is that in this vision, the Apostle John, he's being carried into the wilderness, which in, um, in Revelation 12, 6, it tells us that it is the period of 1260 years where the dragon is going to persecute uh, the faithful woman, God's church. So this vision is taking place somewhere within, in, during this period of 1260 years of the papacy, supremacy, and he is seeing a woman, which is a symbol of a church, that it is riding upon a beast that has seven heads and ten horns. And a beast is a political kingdom, right? So, we continue. Oh, and it's telling us in verse 6 that this woman is drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So, this is telling us this woman has, has been uh, persecuting. It's already drunk with the blood. So this is pointing us towards the end of the, this 1260 year period. But isn't it also one of, the one of the seven angels that had the seven vials? So this is during also the plagues, the, mm -hmm. the last seven plagues. So this is also basically dealing with future. Not during the seven last plagues. It's, it's, it's John, when he's seeing these visions, he's not actually standing in the seven last plagues. He's seeing visions, and then a vision mm -hmm. happens, and then another one happens, and then another one happens. So it's, there's a connection to the seven last plagues, but it's not necessarily during that time period. Yes, that's correct. So this woman, this uh, religious institution that is controlling the political powers, is drunken with the, the during this 1260 years of persecution there were uh, many martyrs this is towards the end and we continue reading um, Marco brothers um, seven, eight, and the angel said unto me wherefore did thou marvel I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven head, heads, heads and ten horns. Mm -hmm. And eight. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. Mm -hmm. So, this is telling us that this, this power that persecutes God's people, when he is seeing it, the, the Apostle John, the, this beast was and is not and shall ascend, it says, out of the bottomless pit. So, it's going to resurrect. And um, verse 9, 9 and 10. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Mm -hmm. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as king one hour with the beast. Okay, let's pause here. So, in this riddle is telling us that there are seven kings, five are fallen. So, this is placing us after the... Um, This is the fifth kingdom, pagan Rome, papal Rome. And this is the period of 1260 years, 
that is mentioned in Revelation 12.6. And this is when the woman is being <coughs> is drunk with the blood of the saints. And in the riddle, it's, tell, it's pointing us actually here in the point of transition between these two. It's in when the sixth kingdom is being identified or is being mentioned as the one that is. So this is five are fallen, one is, and the other, which will be the seventh, is not yet. So this is, is not yet come. So this is five are fallen, one is, uh, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Um, and then it tells us that the eight is of the seven. So it has already been manifested in the past, is going to come back into life and goeth into perdition. That's one of the characteristics of this power is associated with perdition. Uh, and like Judas, the son of perdition, is typified by Judas. And it tells us that this, this kingdom that is not yet is associated with ten horns, or um, which are also ten kings. So this is the United Nations is represented in Bible prophecy. The way it is represented is as ten kings. And... Um, that have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Uh, so, who's next? Um, yes, Lawrence, verses 13 and 14. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their heart to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So which, who is this woman? It's, it's Babylon, right? We're, she was identified previously in verse 5 as Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So if you notice, these ten kings, first they're going to give they're um, it's telling us that they are going to give their power and strength unto the beast. But at the end of this short reign, what is going to happen to this woman? Or what are the ten? They're going to eat her flesh and burn with fire. Yeah. So they place it in the throne and then what they do with her is they, they take her down. They destroy her, right? So this is... Uh, this is the process that is being uh, portrayed in these verses. So now we are going to try to just, uh, we have seen a general overview. We're going to try to identify more specifically the identity of this uh, sixth, the seventh, and the eighth kingdom. So um, we. Um, well, the fifth kingdom, um, it's already addressed. It's, the, it's described as the wilderness, the 1260 years. That is found in Revelation 12.6. Um, this, the sixth kingdom, we find it in Revelation chapter 13. Actually, in Revelation chapter 13, you have two beasts being mentioned. 
the first beast is going to come out of the sea. And this beast is a composite beast and it has also seven heads and ten horns and one of his heads received a deadly wound. So who, who is this composite beast? Um, it's, um. yes, it's uh, Papal Rome, right? So in, in Revelation chapter 12 actually also mentions a beast like a dragon, a scarlet dragon, that has seven heads and ten horns and we're going to see that this symbolizes pagan Rome so in chapter 13 introduces the next power which is this leopard like composite beast and um, this composite beast is um, papal Rome receives a deadly wound and then there is another beast that is introduced from verses 11 onwards that tells us I beheld another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon who is this uh, lamb like beast? United. it's the United States so it's these chapters is showing us a progression first is showing the if, if we are familiar with Revelation chapter 12 it presents we have it here this dra red scarlet dragon that is is standing by the woman ready to devour her the child is representing pagan Rome that it was going to be the instrument to to destroy the Messiah and then then this next chapter introduces another beast which is papal Rome and this is the one that is going to make war for 1260 years and is going to be succeeded by the lamb like beast which uh, it's represented here in this 1850 chart and is a symbol of the United States and so this sixth kingdom we see is the United States and Sister White is going to confirm this in Great Controversy page 100, 440 it says but the beast with lamb like horns was seen coming up out of the earth instead of overthrowing other powers to establish itself the nation thus represented must arise in territory previously unoccupied and grow up gradually and peacefully it could not then arise among the crowded and struggling nationalities of the old world or world that turbulent sea of peoples multitudes and nations and tongues it must be sought in the western continent what nation of the new world was in 1798 rising into power giving promise of strength and greatness and attracting the attention of the world the application of the symbol admits of no question one nation and one and only one meets the specifications of this prophecy it points unmistakably to the United States of America so in 1798 is the point of transition between the papacy and the United States of America and uh, this is the sixth kingdom and in Isaiah 23 verses 15 through 17 Isaiah 23 verses 15 through 17 uh, Michael you want to read it? 15 through 17 mm -hmm. this um, kingdom the sixth kingdom the one that <coughs> is is going to be um, represented Isaiah 23 15 through 17 and it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years according to the days of one king after the end of seventy years shall Tyre sing as in harlot 
Take an harp, go about the city, thou harlot that hast been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs, that thou mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass after the end of seventy years, that the Lord shall visit Tyre, and she shall return to her hire, and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. So this harlot that is here typified as Tyre, <coughs> commits fornication with the kings of the earth. This is the same harlot that was described in Revelation 17. And this harlot that controls the kingdoms of the earth is telling us that it's going to be forgotten for 70 years according to the days of one king or one kingdom. When was the papacy forgotten? In 1798, when it received its deadly wound, when the civil power was removed from this religious institution. So, during the days of one kingdom, it's going to be forgotten, and this is represented as a period of 70 years, which is symbolic. Um, so this is covering the entire history of the Sixth Kingdom and it is forgotten at the beginning. We know this um, Sixth Kingdom actually begins with the Seven Thunders. We will address that in a moment. And this um, it was typified by the Seven Last Kings of Judah. And who was the first from the, the seventh from the last. Manasseh. It was Manasseh, which means forget. forget. So this is, in 1798, there is a forgetting being marked here, prophetically. This is the forgetting of the papacy. But this harlot is going to be remembered, and is going to be remembered at the Sunday law. And in the seven last kings of Israel, the one that lines up with this event, the Sunday law, is Zedekiah, which means remember. This is the period of the seventh kingdom, represented by a 70, number 70. And we have, after that, the seventh kingdom, the seventh kingdom we already mentioned represented by the ten kings and we are saying it is the United Nations and the United Nations is it was founded in the year 1945 and its purpose is to promote international cooperation in reality its purpose is to create a new world order yes. it's to bring all the nations together and have a form of government that supersedes the sovereignty of each nation. So this is its real purpose. In, um, is uh, the seventh. And after that we have the eighth kingdom, which we were told is of the seventh. And the number eight is symbolizes what symbolizes number eight? Resurrection. Resurrection. Uh -huh. Circumcision was performed in which day? Eight. The eighth eight. day. And circumcision is typified in the typified in the in the New Testament. What is the equivalent? Baptism. Baptism, Baptism which represents a death and resurrection. And in, if you count the horns in Daniel chapter 8, the horns that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, you're going to notice that the little horn comes as number 8. Because first you have a ram with two horns, and then it's going to be attacked by a he goat that has a horn, so you have three. And this he goat has, this notable horn is going to be broken. And it's going to be um, followed by four other horns, notable ones. So you have seven. And 
then you have the appearance of the little horn, number eight. There are several ways in which the number eight can be associated with the papacy, as a symbol of the papacy. Why is the papacy symbolized with resurrection? <coughs> He's the only one who resurrects. He's the only one. Besides of Christ. Yes. <laughs> and the power that comes back. Yes, it is the Antichrist, right? It's. Uh, so, that's the number eight. Now, we're going to cover now about the seven thunders because we need uh, to put this in place. We know the seven thunders is a deal. The special light given to John, we're told in Bible, seven Bible commentary, page one, 971. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of events, which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. So, the seven thunders, we understand, in this is the Millerite history, is covering the history of the first and second angels leading up to the third, right? And when does the second angel arrive in, Mil in Millerite history? When did the first angel arrive? 1798. When does the second angel arrive? April 19. April 19, 1844. And this is going to end in October 22, 1844, right when the third angel is going to arrive. So, this is the history of the first and second angel. 46 years in between. This is the seven thunders in the Millerite history. But Sister White tells us also in the same page, after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book, seal up those things which the seven thunders utter. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. So the seven thunders are also events that are going to take place in the future from the time when this quote was written. And she says, Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. John sees the little book and sealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. So, the seven thunders are events that took place during Millerite history and are repeated at the end of the world. The Sixth Kingdom, which is a focal point in Bible prophecy, begins with a seven thunders and ends with a seven thunders. So this is the Alpha and the Omega. The, um, that's a characteristic of the Sixth Kingdom. And this, in, in this uh, line, we, we, we will do well to try to keep in mind that there is an interaction between God's people and the nations of the world. So this is a dynamic internal-external. In the seven thunders have been prefigured, we're going to see in a moment, in several places in history. In, in, for instance, uh, the seven last kings of Judah. We understand now that the, between Cyrus and Artaxerxes, there is another uh, seven kings, which typify also the seven thunders. And more recently, it was called to our attention that even during the Babylonian Empire, Neo-Babylonian Empire, there is also seven kings identified. Um, so, the last seven kings of Judah typify the seven thunders. The seven kings of Babylon typify the seven thunders. The seven kings of Medo-Persia from Cyrus to Artaxerxes typify the seven thunders. And we are seeing uh, other examples uh, in the Bible that all of them have some typification of what is taking place at the end of the world. And so in this, um, this 
Seven Thunders are portraying this dynamic. Is the people of God as they are interacting with these nations. This is what is exemplified also when you think about the churches, the seven churches and the seals, how they are parallel histories. But the churches are dealing with the internal history. It, this is with the work that God is trying to do to raise up a spiritual temple during these 46 years. This is the internal work. But simultaneously, the nations of the earth are interacting and they are also um, in they are um, yeah they're interacting with God's people so God in in this history he has tied uh, um, God's people with the land this is something that we learn from this Prophecy of the Seven Times, one of the things it teaches us is, is connecting ancient literal Israel with modern Israel, which is Adventism. And ancient Israel, God gave them a land that they were supposed to keep. But because of their disobedience, they, that land was invaded. And this is portraying a progressive decline, the seven thunders in this, in this line of Judah is showing a progressive decline of God's people and a progressive conquering where this pagan nation of Babylon was taking control over God's people, over the glorious land and, and the land that they had received. So this is... Uh, 2,520 years later, is telling us the same story, but now it is modern Israel, Seventh-day Adventism, which also has been given a land. And what is the land that has been given? Yeah, the United States. And this is portraying the same history. It's portraying a progressive fall of the glorious land where uh, there is a conquering taking place by the, what was the nation that was conquering the people of God back here. He was the king of the north. And this is the same uh, surrendering that is taking place at this, in this history. And um, <clears throat> so this is one of the aspects that is being, that we can um, see from, or learn from the seven thunders. And we also have, um, we understand that another th aspect to keep in mind is that some of these nations have been represented in prophecy as two-horned powers. These are nations that are made up of two powers. Some of them. Israel, we already mentioned, was an example of this. And uh, in these nations serve a purpose to place the king of the north on the throne of the earth and then another two horn power comes and is going to take it away from the throne so there is this a dynamic here also that we need to notice israel in what way did israel place babylon in the kingdom of the, of the world well because of the disobedience they came a time in 677 when they, they could no longer avert the curse, they were going to be scattered. And the, the father of Manasseh, whose name was Hezekiah, he awoke he, uh, the covetousness of the Babylonians when these Babylonian ambassadors came to his kingdom. Uh, he showed them his treasures, the, the, and that awoke the interest of Babylon. So they came, and they, with Nebuchadnezzar in the year 607, according to one of the reckonings in um, Usher. And um, this is when he invaded for the first time, during the fourth year of Jehoiakim. And... Uh, 
this is when in this year you have the, the beginning of the prophecy of the 70 years that was given by Jeremiah. Jeremiah in this year prophesied a captivity of 70 years. So a two-horned power nation is inviting the king of the north to come and take possession. And then a two-horned power nation is going to come and is going to remove, after this 70-year period, is going to come and is going to remove uh, the king of the north. And this was Middle Persia, which is made of two nations, obviously. So this is something that we want to keep in mind. We're going to address this period of 70 years. We have another period of 70 years here, implicit, between 677 and 607. is not mentioned, but if this date, if this date is correct, then you will have about 70 years in between. This is between the f when Manasseh was removed or was taken captive, that was the, the warning sign. And then 70 years later, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he is going to besiege Israel for the first time. And he's going to continue to do that until Jerusalem is <coughs> destroyed. And um, so this is another period of 70 years that we are familiar with. And um, then we, after these seven thunders in the period of Middle Persia, we have... The seventh king, Artaxerxes, is going to pass a decree in 457 BC. And this is the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. So we have another prophetic period associated with number 70. And this is going to end in the year 34. This is during the reign of pagan Rome. And this is the... During this last week of the 70, this is when you have the Messiah. This is when you have the covenant being established for one week. And um, you have, so you have pagan Rome is going to be making war with the Messiah. And with the apostolic church as well during, during that period. And um, another aspect that we want to cover, um, the, how much time do we have? Half hour? Half hour, okay. So, <clears throat> we're going to see now the symbolism of the dragon. We need to put that in place. The dragon in the Bible. Because this is one of the players in this uh, and what is the primary s meaning of the dragon in the Bible according to Revelation 12 9 Satan. is Satan which was uh, cast out of heaven and um, Revelation 12. 12 9 yeah I'm going to read that. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's the primary meaning of the symbol of the dragon. It began in heaven. And, but the dragon is going to be moving through this history, and we are going to see the dragon in, in during this history, we're going to see it symbolized in pagan Rome. And this is a quote from great, we see in Revelation 12 in the same chapter. Uh, we're going to, but I'm going to read a quote in Great Controversy 438. The line of prophecy in which these symbols are found begins with Revelation 12, 
with the dragon that sought to destroy Christ at his birth. The dragon is said to be Satan. He it was that moved upon Herod to put the Savior to death. But the chief agent of Satan in making war upon Christ and his people during the first centuries of the Christian era was the Roman Empire, in which paganism was the prevailing religion. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of pagan Rome. So pagan Rome in this history is the dragon. And it's the agent, this is the, the agent that the, the Satan is using to persecute God's people. And another definition of the dragon, another meaning, we find, we extracted from the following quote, Testimonies to the Ministers, page 38. It tells us that kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. What, uh, what book? This is Testimonies to Ministers, page 38. Oh, 38. Kings, rulers and governors. So this is the political powers of the earth have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. In their enmity against the people of God, they show themselves guilty also of the choice of Barabbas instead of Christ. So keep that in mind. They're going to choose uh, Barabbas. These political nations is the dragon, symbolizing the dragon. Um, now, in next, we're going, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, because we're going to see a transition taking place between pagan Rome and papal Rome, between the fourth and the fifth kingdom, where the dragon, there's, we're going to zoom in and we're going to, we're going to try to understand the, this transition. This is the dragon and we're going to see how this is going to place the papacy into the throne of the world. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Uh, Patrick, can you read it for us? <coughs> <clears throat> After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking great things. Mm -hmm. So the fourth beast, this is pagan Rome, it tells us that it had ten horns, or it, would, it was made up of ten nations. And these, uh, but from these ten nations, three were uprooted by a little horn that came in among them, and that's the papacy. So this history, what it's describing is the events that took place in... Is in this history, in the year 321, Emperor Constantine, he is the Emperor of Rome, is going to enact a, the first Sunday law in, in his kingdom. And the principle is national apostasy is followed by national ruin. So God is going to visit with judgment this, this kingdom. And... Um, in the year 330, he's going to make a decision of moving the, the capital of the kingdom of Rome from the east, from the west, uh, 
he's going to move it to the east, to Constantinople. And so he's going to leave a vacuum, he's going to leave the city of Rome vulnerable, and then you have the invasions of the barbaric invasions. This is the trumpets that are going to begin to punish Rome. And as a result, in the year 476, what happened with pagan Rome? Close. Or no. Sorry. In the year 476, it was fully divided into, it was fully divided into ten nations. Yes. So this is the ten horns. Uh, this is ten horns. It's ten nations. But out of these ten horns, there was a horn that distinguished itself. And it became the premier king of these ten nations. And he was going to make war. This was Clovis, which is the king of the Franks, which is the, the um, or France. And he's going to become the sword of the Catholic Church. So in this history, what you have is three nations are going to be removed, which stay the interposed in the way of the ascendancy of the papacy. And these were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Those three nations of these ten had to be removed. And Clovis was the sword, because the papacy has no armies of their own. They have to rely on civil powers. And Clovis was more than happy to be the military power to remove these nations and in the year 496 it's when he converted from paganism to Catholicism and by the year uh, 508 paganism had been removed from, uh, had from the kingdom so these, as a result, seven nations now they were playing, play, uh, they were supporting the um, the papacy, and this is when, thirty years later, you have the the papacy sitting upon the throne of the earth. So, in what we have in this history is um, that the dragon is going to give its power and its military power it's going to give its seat the city of Rome and it's going to give his authority through Justinian five, in the year 533 I believe is, is going to uh, favor the, the, the bishop of Rome as the correct of heretic, heretics and so it's going to give all its support to, uh, the, to, to the Catholic Church so they can now reign upon the city of Rome. So the emperor was reigning on the east in Constantinople and in Rome you have the, the, the bishop of Rome reigning. So in this transition what we have is one uh, nation or one king Clovis he is serving as the, um, the sword of the papacy to um, to uproot three nations, three geographical obstacles for the papacy. So this um, is a two-horn nation. France, we're going to see in a moment. It's made up of two powers. Well, yes, I'm not sure that he really uh, uprooted all the three of them. Well. Right. Yeah, he yes, he was involved perhaps in two, I think. Two, yeah. Yes, and but then one of them defeated the other, I believe. Uh, yeah. One of these nations defeated another, but he was involved nevertheless. He was um, he was declared to be the eldest son of the church. So France became the first one to support the papacy, and he became the first one. We're going to see also to remove it. Uh. <coughs> One question. Yes. You said in 508 
uh -huh. paganism had been removed. Was it because now all the other um, six horns after Clovis mm -hmm. had been con were converted to Catholicism? Yeah. So there were no pagans left. Yeah, I, I, if I remember correctly, by the year, uh, okay, 496, by 508 was the conversion of um, Charlemagne, I, or no, no, for, no, the, no, the, uh, sorry, the, um, the king of England, I don't remember his name. I think this is the wrong concept. The this wrong concept. didn't happen in 508, it happened something else happened. Okay. Thank yeah, you. they they thought that it was King Arthur and it was one of the one of the arguments, but there was another argument that took place in that that identifies another history like you're saying in Five okay. Away. Yeah. I can and I, I can't remember. Well it's it's that the resistance against the Romans is from the um from the from the paganism or from mm -hmm. the Arianism stopped. Stopped in yes. five oh eight. Okay. When uh, <coughs> the Ostrogoths yeah, it has to be and uh, and the uh, Visigoths, mm -hmm. the Ostrogoths were conquered by Clovis, and the Visigoths stepped in and, and won against Clovis. But instead mm -hmm. of taking advantage of the victory, they decided to make a peace contract with Clovis. Yeah. And since then, no longer was there any. That have been in the spring of five oh eight. Five oh eight. So that that would be this this event here. This is during this period. Satan was using pagan nations to make war against the people of God. Now he's going to change. Here is the transition. Uh, he's switching now to a, uh, a counterfeit Christianity. He's going to now uh, use the papacy, which is a counterfeit. Uh, it's really paganism disguised of Christianity. So he's, it's switching powers now. And these 1260 years that uh, the papacy reigned, but this is, but mo this is um, spiritual Babylon, the papacy. We are told in Prophets and Kings 714 that God's church on earth was as verily in captivity during this long period of relentless persecution, referring to the 1260 as were the children of Israel held captive in Babylon during the period of the exile. This, this is uh, the Babylonian exile. So, this 1260 is also typified by the 70 years. So this is a symbolic 70, we could say. There's, what we have here is a two-horn power placing the papacy on the throne of the world. He's going to be allowed to rule for 70 years. And then he's going to be judged. He's going to be removed by another two-horn power. In this case, is the, the dragon also. And he's going to take him from the throne. We know that um, during this history, if you think about the churches, what is the church that, that um, lines up with this period? Would be the church of Thyatira. Which was preceded by white, what church? Pergamos. Pergamos, which is the church of compromise. Pergamos. This is the compromise that the Christian church was, was accommodating the, uh, the emperor, allowing the emperor Constantine to bring its pagan um, customs into the church. This is also... Um, <coughs> this is also the mystery of iniquity already working to um, that is going to place the man of sin of Barabbas during this period. Uh, so this period ended in 1798 and in 1798 um, France take, took the papacy from the throne. Another definition of the dragon, we, found, we find it in Ezekiel 29, verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 through 3. 
29. Yes, 29, thank you. One, two, three. Um. Uh, who's next? Um, in the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the, swor <coughs> the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which have said, my river is mine own, and I have made it my, for myself. Mm -hmm. So, who is represented also as the dragon? Egypt. 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 And it's, it's, in these verses, it's emphasizing even Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So, the dragon is Satan. The dragon was pagan Rome. The dragon uh, is the political kingdoms of the earth. Therefore, it was... The extension of the dragon where the ten horns, these ten nations were symbolizing the dragon as well. And uh, you have now um, the, the dragon is also representing Egypt. And um, <coughs> this is going to help us identify France in a moment. When we go to Revelation 11, verse 3. Revelation 11, verse 3. And... 7 through 8. So, um, yeah. Revelation 11, 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days, closed in sackcloth. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. Yes. And when they shall have finished the testimony, the beast that descendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom, in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Okay, so at the end of these 1260 years, where the two witnesses, which is the, the, the Bible, the Old and New Testament, were going to prophesy cloth and sackcloth, a new power is going to ascend, a new manifestation, and this power is going to make war against the scriptures and is going to overcome them and kill them. And this power is identified as a great city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Which power is being identified historically here? France. It's France, which was atheism, right? The, the, the two horns here Egypt, which is going to tell us in Great Controversy, page 200, 200, 269, she's going to tell us that atheism is, Egypt <coughs> is a symbol of atheism. <coughs> and it, it, I read, it says, The great city in whose streets the witness are slain, and where their bodies, dead bodies lie, is spiritually, <coughs> is spiritually Egypt. Of all nations, Presented in the Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. And I'm going to jump. It says, this, um, this is atheism and the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom. The corruption of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifested in licentiousness. And this sin was also to be preeminent characteristic of the nation that should be should fulfill this specification in the scriptures. So, she tells us that this nation, France, is going to manifest the atheism of Pharaoh, who boldly deny the existence of God and the licentiousness of Sodom. So you have Sodom and Egypt is the two powers of France. It's atheism and licentiousness. And uh, this is during this, the time period of the French Revolution is when they're going to 
speak, they're going to legislate that God does not exist. And they're going to set forth a philosophy, a theistic philosophy, that is going to be implemented as the, um, the form of government. Their, their government is going to be atheistic. So we have here once again this same history being repeated. Spiritual Babylon being placed on the throne of the world by a two-horned nation is being removed by a two-horned nation it, and it reigned during that period of time. And uh, <clears throat> we have now um, this brings us to the, these events that we just described. We are familiar with them in Daniel 11 verse 40. Part A describes the king of the south pushing against the king of the north. And who is the king of the north? It's who was the king of the north in 1798? It's the power that is ruling Babylon, spiritual Babylon, which was the papacy. Was It was pushed by the power that rules Egypt. And who was spiritual Israel, Egypt, sorry, in 1798? It was France. So this is the events of Daniel 11, part A. But verse 40, part A. Yes, thank you. First, verse 40, part <coughs> A. And <coughs> this, um, but the remaining part of the verse is going to portray <coughs> a transition that takes place. And this atheistic philosophy that was manifested in France and it was going to be adopted by another nation, actually by a conglomerate of nations. It's going to be transform its name and it's going to become communism. And, but it's the same, the same atheistic denial of God. And it's going to appear during this history in the USSR. It's going to be manifested in is, this is the, the events described in Daniel 11, verse 40, part B, when the king of the north is going to retaliate against the king of the south, against the USSR, and is going to overflow. So <coughs> this is the events that took place in 1989. Um, when the demise of the uh, former Soviet Union uh, took place in 1989 was the fall of the Berlin Wall and that was um, marking the, the demise of communism in Eastern Europe and in uh, the USSR. And um, what we have here, then, therefore, is um, we're going to go to Ezekiel 29, we're approaching the end of our study. Uh, Ezekiel 29, we're going to read verses 17 through 21. Ezekiel 29, verses 17 through 21. <coughs> um, yes. Yeah. And it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth year, in the first month, in the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet he had no wages, nor his army for Tyre, for the service that he had served against it. And therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, 
and take her spoil and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, saith the Lord God. In that day will I cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. So this is bringing us to um, the line of, or of Ezra. It is, it's bringing us to the, the understanding <coughs> of the first day of the first month, in, as it applies in our history. And it's telling us that on the first day of the first month, the papacy is going to be given Egypt as a payment. And um, going, the land of Egypt is going to be given to the king of the north as a payment wages for his army. So this, no doubt, the seventh kingdom is the United Nations. Is, this is Egypt for sure because it's the ten kings once again. Um, this is um, kings, rulers, and governors they're going to give their allegiance to the papacy. So this is Egypt. But it's telling us here that on the first day of the first month that the papacy is going to receive as wages the land of Egypt. So this is, again, in, during this history, Egypt is going to begin to be manifested uh, in during the in the United States the attributes of Egypt are going to be manifested in this land like beast if you remember this land like the land is a symbol of uh, Christianity it's a it's a symbol of innocence that's how the spirit of prophecy describes it but it's going this uh, Kingdom is going to end up speaking like what? A dragon. A dragon. And a dragon is a symbol of what? Atheism. Atheism is a symbol of atheism. It's a symbol of Egypt, right? Yeah. So it, during this history, a transition is going to take place with this Christian nation is actually going to legislate, because that's what speaking means, is going to legislate laws that are going to be actually defying God that are going to be denying God and is going to be manifesting the, the spirit of the dragon because it's also make, going to make war against the people of God. So somewhere in this history, this transition or this transformation takes place and, and the first day of the first month helps us to understand this process because um, the, this is the progressive conquering of the glorious land. We have in Millerite history, these two horns are going to be conquered. The first one during Millerite history, April 19, 1844, this is the first day of the first month. This is the first disappointment. This is when the second angel arrived. And um, what was the message the second angel declares? Babylon. Babylon is fallen. It's marking the rejection of a message. Who rejected the message in, in, in this? The Protestants. The Protestants. The two horns of this nation, the first one is Protestantism and the second is Republicanism. So it's marking that the religious power <coughs> rejected, uh, rejected God. And therefore, um, it's conquered. But this conquer is progressive and it is going to be completed during our history. And the power that is going to be conquered in our history is the political one, is republicanism. And that is what took place in the first day of the first month in our history, which lines up with 9-11. And the, um, internally, we are told that this is when 
In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to bow forth. So what happened in 9-11 internally or for God's people is the sprinkling of the latter rain begins. The, the horn of the house of Israel of David is going to begin to bow forth. But externally what was taking place uh, in 9-11 historically? Patriot Act. Patriot Act, which is actually a bridge to the the Fourth Amendment of the the, the Bill of Rights, and uh, <clears throat> the so we have here the conquer of republicanism and. At this point, Egypt is identified, because this is, we are saying here, this is when the land of Egypt is given to the papacy, is at 9-11, the U.S. already possesses the attributes of uh, Egypt, and is going to be ready to speak as a dragon at the Sunday law, and um, the... This, um, okay, we can understand that, the, how this transition took place. If we remember that pr just prior to 1989, the Ronald Reagan, he was willing to make a secret alliance with the Pope. He was placing his armies, his military power, to the service of the Pope, just like Clovis did it. Uh, for the papacy. So he is, uh, the United States was typified by Clovis and he is putting his sword uh, to the disposal of the, to place the, pape, the Pope, to, to resurrect the Pope. And um, uh, as a result, the first of the three geographical obstacles was removed the USSR, and um, so this is, once again, the history is repeating. All these two horn powers are typifying the role of the United States at the end of the world. The United States is becoming a drag, becomes a Egypt, and he, the... The United States is also the premier king of the ten, just like Clovis was in this history. And then combined, they're going to place the papacy in the throne uh, at the end of the world. And um, this is what one of the lessons we can learn from that. Brother Noel, in 1989, George Sr. Bush was already president. Mm -hmm. So even though... Um, <coughs> Ronald Reagan got the credit. He was not longer president during that time. It was yes. George II. Yes, yes, because the secret alliance took place prior to prior that day. to that. Yes. yes, but this is when prophetically it's <coughs> marking yeah. the yeah. the the result of that secret alliance is what brought the, yes, the communism current, yeah. in that year. Yes, and so in just one a point here is that some of you may not have seen this in 1798. Uh, historical event took place is <coughs> here the <coughs> it's this is taken from history.com this is the history channel but you can find it online in under sedition act and in on this day July the 14th of 1798 one of the most egregious or terrible breaches of the US Constitution in history became federal law when the Congress passed the Sedition Act. So 1798, there was something passed called Sedition Act. Endangering liberty in the fragile new nation, while the United States engaged in naval hostilities with revolutionary France, known as the Quasi War, Alexander Hamilton, the Congressional Federalist, took advantage of the public's wartime fears and drafted and passed the Alien and Sedition Acts without first consulting President John Adams. John Adams was the second president of the United States. The first three acts took aim at the right of immigrants. And so 
it says the period of residency required before immigrants could apply for citizenship was extended from 5 to 14 years, and the president gained the power to detain and deport those he deemed enemies. President Adams never took advantage of this new full ability to deny right to immigrants. However, the fourth act, the Sedition Act, was put into practice and became a black mark on the nation's reputation. In direct violation of the Constitution's guarantee of freedom of speech, the Sedition Act permitted the prosecution of individuals who voiced or printed what the government deemed to be malicious remarks about the president or government of the United States. Fourteen Republicans, mainly journalists, were persecuted and some imprisoned under the Act. In opposition to the Alien and Sedition Acts, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison drafted the Virginia and Kentucky Resolves, declaring the Acts to be a violation of the First and Tenth Amendment. President Adams... Um, so, they, this only lasted briefly, but nevertheless places a precedent in 1798 where you have a law that is being enforced. It was not a religious law. But nevertheless, it, it, was an, it was a violation of the First Amendment. And the First Amendment is the, I'm reading this to you, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respect, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So the First Amendment deals both with the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion. So in 1798, the First Amendment was transgressed because they were repressing the freedom of speech. But the Alpha typifying the Omega, at the end of the, this Sixth Kingdom, you're going to have once again a pronouncement, a law, that is going to be violating once again the First Amendment, but this is going to be also restricting the freedom of religion at this time. And uh, so we have that also in place. And just the final thought here uh, to bring it to a circle. The, we read in um, the quote from the Spirit of Prophecy from quoting from Ezekiel 21 verses 26 and 27 where it says, Thus said the Lord God, remove the diadem and take the crown. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn. This is dealing with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Overturn uh, it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right is, and I will give it him. And during this kingdom, it was the coming, the first coming of Christ, and he was he came to establish the kingdom of grace. But this pattern, these fourth kingdoms that are presented in uh, <coughs> in Daniel, is repeated when these fourth uh, kingdoms at the end of the world uh, follow the same the same pattern. You have the fifth kingdom is going to be overturned overturn and overturn so that Christ can come during the last the reigning of the last kingdom and he is going to uh, establish his kingdom of glory and this is um, some of the lessons that we can draw from this history uh, yeah. what, what verse and or is that in overturn, overturn, overturn? I believe it is uh, 26 and 27 yes it's Oh, sorry, so chapter? what we are twenty-one. Oh, twenty-one. Yes. So what we are understanding is that these these four kingdoms of Bible prophecy, um, this the four last ones, um, overlay upon this. They, you can overlay them on top of this, and they repeat. Israel being a type of the no Babylon being a type of the papacy, with the Persia being a type of the U.S., Greece being a type of the United Nations, and pagan Rome being a type of modern, modern Rome. So, shall we pray? The Father in Heaven, uh, this has basically been just an introductory uh, study. We know that this is opening to a depth 
and that we previously did not anticipate as we see those four kingdoms being repeated in the last four and as we see how the new dimensions of the prophetic word are being opened before our eyes and we pray that we will strive to understand these things for ourselves that we may be found among the faithful uh, subjects of that kingdom of glory that is is going to be implemented very very soon and it is our prayer to be part of it in jesus name we pray amen